in November of 69, I actually went along to the Perth Soul Room to see David Bowie who's doing a concert there with Tony Visconti and his trio. And like everybody else, I was just totally spellbound. But I hadn't really had an outlet where I could uh, use David. Now having the outlet of the In Concert program and seeing David perform as well as he did at the Perth Soul Rooms, I had no doubt in my mind that he would be able to do it. And interestingly, when I booked him and uh, the list of the artists I was booking for that quarter actually went up in front of my line manager. He was very suspicious about it, called me in, and he, he knew one or two of the names on that. He had heard of David Bay. He said, but, you know, can this guy do an hour by himself? And I said, yes, absolutely. He said, well, it's on your head. I said, I know that. I'm happy for it to be. He was quite affable. I mean, he was a fairly easy person to work with. But, uh, I mean, certainly for that first in concert, I think he was just pleased to be there. And, you know, John Peel was introducing it. And it was a great platform, you know, an hour of just him and uh, three other musicians. Well, in fact, the first part was just him with his guitar. And then the others gradually joined in. Uh, Tony Visconti on bass, Mick Ronson on guitar, and John Cambridge on drums. And, uh, you know, just to fill out the sound a little bit more. And as the sunrise stream flickers on One day we got a phone call from Bowie and he, he called Mick and he said, would we go down and do a radio show, the John Peel show? And I wasn't supposed to play, play bass. I was supposed to, Ebby Flowers was playing bass. <coughs> I was just going to go down for the rad. So I went down with him and we got there on a Sunday afternoon and uh, first time I'd ever met David at Haddon Hall and stuff. And I went in there and he had Woody set his kit up and Mick, Mick set his guitar amp up and then all of a sudden all these mates of David's appeared that were going to sing backing vocals and sing with him on this John Peel show. And then all of a sudden Bowie turned around to me and says, well, are you going to set your bass gear up then? And I said, what? <laughs> <laughs> I thought Abby Flowers was doing it, you know. And he said, no, no, Abby can't do it, can you do it? So I said, all oh, right, yeah. So we spent about two hours rehearsing and in that period of time I had to learn 12 Bowie songs. And some of them were off Hunky Dory, which had, nobody had ever really played before, you know. So it was, uh, it was quite nerve-wracking event to actually get that many songs off for a radio show. Plus, I'd never played on radio before, so I was really nervous. Plus, I'd never met any of these people, you know. Um, and that was my introduction to David. And of course, we went to the John Peel show the next day. And, and from then on, I think it was the following week, we, we did Hunky Dory. Well, just looking down the running order, the, the one we did in January, these, these were both sessions for uh, Bob Harris uh, Sounds of the 70s that I was producing that time. Um, on the one that we did in January, we've got Hang On To Yourself, oh, well, Ziggy Stardust, Queen Bitch, I'm Waiting For The Man, the Lou Reed song, and Five Years. The interesting thing about those sessions, actually, from my point of view, is that we did them in the morning at Made of, at Made of Our Studios. Now, Normally one would avoid like mad getting rock bands in to do sessions in the morning because you know, probably would have been travelling overnight from some godforsaken part of the UK. Um, and it's always difficult, anybody who sings would know how difficult it is anyway to try and get your voice in shape in the morning. Uh, but uh, actually both of them were really good sessions, very energetic. I think David was actually a bit late for the first one. so. Uh, but we let him off that because you know once he got there and put the vocals on, they were brilliant, and uh, they is, they stood the test of the time because actually uh, we repeated the sessions quite a lot in later years as sort of archive um, memories. You know.
Yeah, I've actually got my running order from um, the second session we did in 1972 with David. Just here I've got little uh, who was on what and which vocals we would overdub and so on. And uh, while we're in the middle of doing, I'd maybe doing a guitar overdub or something, David actually drew, um, I don't know whether you call it a cartoon or a picture, on the bottom of my running order. And there it still is to this day. <laughs> They were cracking. Um, I wouldn't say full of themselves, because they they, that, that band were not those sort of guys. I mean, they were just really, really good musicians, uh, very competent. And uh, by that time, because they played together so much, it, you know, it, everything really worked. Sing and play guitar, jamming good with weird and giddy, and the spiders If you consider how far it already moved on in 72 from what the sort of material he was doing in the mid 60s, uh, it was pretty obvious that he had the capability of moving on yet again and sort of taking any other movement uh, in his stride. And of course, he, he had a look around who actually started glam rock. I wouldn't like to say, I'll leave that for other people to say, but you know, he looked at it and thought, yes, I'll, yeah, I'll go with that. And but he, he just stayed in glam rock long enough. Uh, you know, before he could see it was going sort of downhill and, you know, didn't go down the Gary Glitter route or anything like that and, and moved on to something else. And that, it's the clever artists that do that. 